All right, everybody, welcome into today's interview. Today, I am joined by Miles Beckler, who is uh, one of the OG Jasper AI, then conversion AI users, I believe, and uh, been around the content game for years, entrepreneur, author, content creator, who um, I, I've, I've been on a few interviews and, and sessions with Miles over the course of the past year, and his approach to content creation really resonates with me. And I know uh, I know it'll resonate with a lot of you out there as well, because it really comes from that authentic, human-driven um, focal point from the beginning, and then using AI to enhance the message that's already in our minds and helping us really make the most out of all the content that we're spending this time um, getting out there into the world. So Miles, not going <laughs> to... Uh, beat you know, beat, beat a horse over the head. Um, the twenty minute introduction oh, here. Um, we got a bunch. You're of not working with Aquasure, are you? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and click mute, and then we're gonna jump into it. Miles, thank you for taking the time to be here, yeah. and uh, excited to 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 dive into your content production process because right now we're doing this interview, kicking off seven day AI book writing challenge. So we've got a whole community of people that are out here writing books, using AI to help speed along the process, and a lot of great stories in people's heads get out in the world, make a lot of impact with getting that there, but I know people are going to get stuck throughout this process, um, and so I wanted to bring you on to just kind of, you know, see, you know, I know you have a lot of value to share. You share everything for free on your YouTube channel and, and you got tons of stuff, but uh, welcome to the show, Miles. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for a while. started internet marketing, uh, affiliate marketing in 2003 is when I made my first dollar online. Uh, so while I was still at community college in California, and I've been with it full time since 2010. So I've got a bunch of experience. And my big thing is trying to help people bring what's in their heart, right? What's in the corazón. And when you tap into that, and you really start to share that kind of, and some of these words are so overused, authenticity, and these kinds of ideas. But the truth is that when you stand in your power, and when you shine your light, uh, everything seems to work better. And some people look at AI as a tool of like, oh, cool. Now I can hide behind my laptop. Now I can hide and, you know, shortcut and not do the work and still publish. But while more and more people attempt to do that, because AI does make that easy, um, the audiences become thirstier and thirstier for honest, truthful, helpful people. Right. So it's it's almost like we're creating this unique divide through more search engine spam, more Kindle spam from these rubbish books that are just getting like book published. And it leaves people with a very sour taste in their mouth. And, and the response to that from the user's standpoint is, I mean, I got to find a real person. I got to find an, uh, an actual person I can trust. And when you, the viewers, step up to be that person for the people in your niche, everything else in your business uh, gets easy. Um, it's a simple plan. It's not necessarily easy, uh, but it is a simple plan. Yeah. And I think it's something It's just a big spotlight on content creation and books right now with all the, all the crap getting spanned on Amazon and people that are, like you said, just taking advantage of just AI automations to just put stuff out. That's a yeah. lot of it's just not even useful when you look at it at the end of the day. But, and I know that that might put a, um, a sense of like, overwhelm or fear that like how are we going to compete with this stuff how are we going to cut through all this noise that's out there and i think that's something that um you do naturally because you've been doing this for so long in your process yeah. so can you just like break down like your workflow for producing content that clearly resonates with your audience um maybe yeah. some tips for folks that are coming in that are going to be writing books with, with the help of ai but ai is not taking their voice it's enhancing um their voice for me, like if there was a secret to success, it's all about the outline, right? And, and that outline is what I look at as what I look to an outline for is that framework to help my audience get some kind of result that they want. Um, people buy books because they want some kind of a result, right? People buy video courses because they want a result. People watch YouTube videos, they read blogs. So it's, it's irrelevant, the direction we publish in, but people are trying to improve their lives. They're trying to experience more happiness and more joy. Um, can save, it, it, it's a million and one ways, right? I want to save money. I want to lose weight. All of these things are linked to essentially more happiness in the life. And when we as creators really like build out systems 
that A, worked for us and B, can work for others. So one example is like affiliate marketing. I've been doing it for a long time, as I mentioned. So I've started over from zero in middle of the game to start a brand new niche site from zero just to kind of prove that my process works, even if you're in a niche that you're not an expert in. So while I was going through that process, I was detailing and I was building my outline. So I forced myself to do the horrifically challenging process of starting over as a beginner, just so I could get, okay, I got to do this first and then that, and then that. And when I teach through, whether it's YouTube video, through blog content, through books, et cetera, when I teach that process that I kind of knew, cause I did it haphazardly the first time. That's how generally we do everything the first time. But then I went and I built a structure and a process around it. And that process got great results. Now, all the little minute details, all the little paragraphs in between, uh, whether I write them myself or I put a couple of notes and have AI write them or I put the draft together and I have AI improve it, that's kind of almost irrelevant because as long as it has my core like process in there, ultimately when the re user reads the book or goes through the video course or whatever it is, they're going to have a really high likelihood of getting the result that they want. If I help them get the result they want, I can have anything I want in the world. And that's a quote. That's an adaptation of a quote from Zig Ziglar. Um, you can have anything you want in this world. If you help enough other people get what they want. Uh, what I love about Kindle books is there's, you know, hundreds of millions. I have no idea how many people have Amazon prime. Somebody would know the data point, but there's a lot of people who have Kindle hardware devices, they're Amazon Prime, they use Amazon as a search engine for when they're like, man, I got to figure out how to blank, they're going to go search on Amazon for that. Some people go to YouTube, some people go to Google. Um, and ultimately, eventually, I think the goal is to kind of be everywhere. Um, that said, I'm spending a lot more time on books. Uh, my wife and I published our first book in 2012. I published three books this year, one of which was almost all written with AI. Um, which was the most nerve wracking experience for me. And then the other ones, I built an outline and I recorded a video where I went through that outline. And this one, these were the ones I was most confident in handing off to a team and, and seeing it done to production. Because when I start with my outline and then I spent about an hour and a half to two hours is what it was. So they're short reads it, technically in Kindle. So, um, eight to 12,000 word Kindle books, like hour and a half short reads is all I really want. Cause I'm trying to help people solve a specific problem. So I do a, you know, hour and a half, two hour video based on this outline, based on a proven process. And then from there, I can hand it off to teammates who then get it transcribed with AI, get it cleaned up, get it improved. We run it through, um, copy editor is a maybe proofreader is a required and then book cover on Fiverr and then layout from a guy on Upwork and boom. So I'm trying to build a system, right? A process that allows me to get my ideas out into a format where I can go after that Amazon search engine and rank several books in several of my key categories, just like I've done with my YouTube channel, my 700 videos there where I rank a bunch of videos just like I've done with my blog posts where I rank a bunch of my content. And if you're doing all the content manually every time, quickly everybody's like, oh God, that's a, that's a lot of work, Miles. And um, it is. So focus is one of our key uh, keys to success, but then also leveraging teams, leveraging technology, leveraging tools from there. Yeah, so you, you point out focus as being like the main key, but then also leveraging the other humans inside of the operation that are on your team and you're passing things off to. Yeah, um, But all of the content that you've been producing seems to have that theme of like knowing again, like what, where are you ending with this? Like, and like, what's the outline that's going to get you there to help somebody else get a result. And because yeah. you've done it so many times through like YouTube, maybe first, you're just taking that same approach to creating proven like YouTube videos that are helping people and gain value. And then, uh, you know, you bring that back to your website, they opt in for your list and you're building a list that you own, which, yep. you know, there's a lot of value in that. But now you're taking it to Amazon and you're taking a two hour video, the Kindle short reads, any benefit to a Kindle short read book, as opposed to someone um, wanting to go maybe a more traditional, like I want to hold a piece of paper, uh, like a paper book in my yep. hand. Yeah. Um... Definitely. And there's benefits to both directions. My biggest benefit is I seem to be able to get them done. And it's kind of like done is better than perfect, right? People who are trying to write that, that masterpiece manuscript, like they can drag that thing on for a very long time. I can go from like idea to execution to launched on Kindle within a few weeks. 
And if I like, I'm looking at Kindle as, or Amazon as a search engine, and I want as many rankings on that search engine as I possibly can. So uh, an example is one of my books is The Niche Navigator. Uh, brilliant title. Thank you, ChatGPT4, for coming up with that, that lovely title right there for me. And the subtitle in the description, it's all written by ChatGPT. Um, so I'm like, okay, in my world of people trying to make money online, one of the just most common challenges is Miles, I don't know what niche to go into. I don't know my niche and I've done free videos on YouTube. So what I ended up doing was putting together a new process, um, an updated process for my old free stuff. I'm actually selling the video course for like $9. So I, I it's a, it's an actual paid course or they can get the book for right now. It's like 99 cents. Um, I thought 99 cents was going to be an introductory offer, but my sales volume is so high that the book is ranking very well at 99 cents that now I, I dare not touch it. So it's a short book, but like somebody who wants to learn how to choose a niche, like let's not drag this question around for 300 pages, right? That is pointless. That's not helping them. Like ultimately I should help, they should choose a niche and then like, okay, let's go do the, the real work now, which is publishing, right? Like build brand in said niche through content. So the faster I can get them over that hurdle. And I guess the way I look at it is I might take nonfiction author speaking, uh, who's very specifically trying to help people get results in this make money online world. Um, I might take what someone could do in a mega book that would have like thump value to it that you could print 300 pages, six by nine, which my wife and I have books like that. Uh, I'm going to break that up into four or five different books because then I can have four or five different rankings. Then I can create more bundles, which I don't know if you've seen the bundles feature on Kindle, but you get a lot more real estate on your actual listing when you start to make bundles. And there's just I, like, I'm not spamming their search engine because that's like, I'm putting up the best quality content I possibly can, but I'm I'm obtaining as many page one rankings for as many categories as I possibly can to help the Miles Beckler brand be everywhere. Um, my wife, on the other hand, I'm pretty sure I got one of her books over here. She's got, uh, I got books everywhere. So one of her, her biggest book is uh, 370 pages or so in a six by nine or a five by eight size. So it's a, it's a very, very noteworthy book. and um, her audience absolutely loves that. It's in the meditation and spirituality space. So it's a bunch of like guided meditations in written format. And even for her brand. So um, quick backstory. Uh, 2003, I started making money online as an affiliate marketer. I wasn't growing an email list. MySpace shut down my links. I was essentially bulk publishing on social media. They shut down my links. I wasn't building an email list. So when my wife and I got together in 2009, we co-founded a site in the meditation and spirituality space. That brand is still running to this very day. And we've got, I think, seven books published. Um, then in 2016, I started teaching everything we learned from growing her brand. And that's the Miles Beckler brand. So I, I'm going to reference both brands. And I wanted a little context there. But within my wife's brand, a lot of her people want that physical book. They want to sit down with it. And we see that even on forever free Kindle books that we have that we literally give away for free on Kindle, um, those are our best-selling print books because people read it on the Kindle and they're like, oh, I actually want this in print. So it's a different user experience. My people want like, help me get the result I want. Help me get over this hurdle, this annoying thing that's bothering me and help me get on the track to whatever I'm trying to accomplish. And my wife's people are a little bit more in the, you know, like help me get in this vibration, help me feel this state of being. And then when they feel it, they're like, man, I want the print version of this too. And it's not like I knew that before we started. We're just like taking a bunch of action, doing whatever we think is the best thing we could possibly do right now, which is always publishing, and then looking at all of the data. And when you see like your free book is actually your best selling print book, it's like, huh, like, wow, why? Right. And so that makes us want to do only books for her brand that are going to have a print book side. So we always push. I think like our rule of thumb roughly is like 25,000 words, I think is when you get enough pages to get a spine. So every time we put a new book together for her, we're, we're definitely making sure it's large enough to print to have a spine because it kind of serves a different purpose because it's a different niche and different avatar. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I mean, again, it's like, who are you writing the book for? And like, is there, is it like maybe an ego driven thing to just have the book when your audience doesn't care, they just want the result or maybe yeah. like, it's like, there's a lot of things that could go into like wanting a physical book beyond it from like a branding mechanism or being able yeah. to mail a book off to a potential partner that like, is like, Oh, I'm on Kindle might have a different 
interact like like level, but again, you're taking a lot of action and you have over the years to figure out like, oh, that's actually what works. But most, they, if you never take that action in the first place, then like, how are you going to find that stuff out that's actually going right. to work, right? And so like, it's interesting how <laughs> much you've learned and how long it's taken you to come through all of these different levels of publishing to when like, when I'm hearing you talk and I like try to distill it back down because it helps me with making sure I can process and understand it. It's like, Hey, like create an outline for something that, you know, what you can talk about and teach on, make a two hour video masterclass on it. Yep. Take that masterclass transcription. And then if you're doing it all yourself, you could run that through GPT quad. Um, and you've mentioned yep. Koala, um, and yep. on, on a previous um, thing that maybe we can talk about some of the tools that you're using in your workflow. Uh, but once you do that, then you're getting like a roughly eight to 12,000 word book that you can then just go and publish on Kindle, like short reads even, and then boom, yep. now you can start to rank in the Amazon search engine, but then you can also repurpose that content, not only on YouTube, not only on Amazon, but now also on your blog. So people are searching Google and finding it. And you're really making the most out of all of that content. And we haven't even talked about repurposing stuff for like Twitter posts or Instagram images right. or all of that sort of thing. Which so. I completely ignore, right? Um, okay. I, I completely ignore the social, social side. And the reason for that is some balance between how much bandwidth do I actually have? Um, how much do I need? There's this concept of enough. And uh, my wife and I, we run it, our business as a million dollars a year plus. So like we're doing very, very well. So when we work, we want to work on things that can work for us for years and a Twitter post is going to work for me for 17 minutes. And that Twitter, Twitter post is dead. And if I get, if I really put out a banger on Instagram, it might bring me attention for my audience for 24 hours, maybe 48 hours, maybe. Right. But if I put out a really good YouTube video, that YouTube video can bring me traffic for years. If I put up a really good book, that book can bring me customers and leads for years. And it's also worth mentioning. So one goal on creating books is obviously helping readers and helping Amazon's customers, because that's an Amazon customer, that's not my customer, uh, helping them get what they want. If my book doesn't actually help, if my niche navigator book doesn't actually help them learn a process that's going to help them get over this giant question, this giant hurdle, they're going to be like, oh, this dude doesn't know what he's talking about. This sucks. This was a waste of time. And it actually hurts my brand. But when it does help them get over the hurdle, this is where I have a bunch of calls to action in my books. And every single book I put on Amazon is growing my list and it's growing my customer list. So Every book promotes all the other books we have. Every book promotes some sort of a lead magnet of sorts to get people onto my email list. So, so because again, Amazon owns that customer until I get them into my ecosystem. Um, so on one of my earliest books, The Seven Figure Side Hustle, um, right after the table of contents, I'm offering them the audiobook for free. And the audiobook mm. is how I record that that's the audio I recorded in order to make the print book. So somebody can click the look inside and they can actually find my call to action and they can see the URL right there before they even buy the book. So in theory, I, I'm gaining some volume of leads from Amazon before they even purchase from Amazon. And at the end of the book, I also have calls to action. And this is just um, really thinking about the user experience and thinking about the process of what people go through on Amazon, playing the Amazon game in a way that I would do well on the Amazon rankings, but also um, in a way that like, we just have to be so mindful of the power that the platforms hold over us. Um, YouTube shuts people down all the time. Facebook shuts down fan pages all the time, right? Like we live in an age I've heard, um, Russell Brand say, uh, the industrial, uh, censorship complex, um, an, that's an apolitical statement, but we live in an age where there's a lot of censorship going on. Google is eliminating certain things from search engines. So if we are all in trusting these mega corporations to do what's right for us long term, we are setting ourselves up potentially for a disastrous outcome where uh, like all of a sudden you pour your heart and soul into books for three to five years and Amazon for some reason, I will say Amazon's really good. They're like the least worrisome to me in that game but still it's it's like we need to play the amazon game in a way that works for amazon 
We need to make sure that the product's great for our customers, but then that whole combination still needs to flow back to people coming into your ecosystem in a way that you own and manage the future longevity of that relationship. So that's how you build a real true sustainable business uh, long-term. And quick note, um, these short books, I mentioned the short reads, they're not in the short, they're, they are in the short reads category, but they're in the normal category. So if you look right now in the um, e-commerce marketing, right, bestsellers in internet marketing, my niche navigator books, number three in that category right now. Um, and my seven figure side hustles, number five. So I've got two books ranking in the top 10. I might have all three of them in the top 10 of internet marketing. I do. Uh, Sales funnel sabotage is number seven. So I'm out ranking all three of Russell Brunson's books right now. I'm punching way above my weight class. And a part of this is, you know, Jeff Walker's below me in that. Like there are some big name people who have more experience at more brand value than I do. And I'm outranking them because sales volume, the star review ratings, pricing, and all of those factors that are the algorithm. And this is where as I get more rankings in my categories, I'm also pushing my competitors farther and farther down. Same game I played in SEO from 2012 to 2020. Um, still play that game a little bit, but I'm, I'm doing less in SEO because it's just easier for people to, people just steal my content left and right. So I put up a blog post and, and there are several people who literally almost instantaneously steal it, rewrite it and publish it to their website. Um, the bar is higher for those folks to, uh, blatantly steal my videos and my books, which still does happen. Yeah. And I've been seeing that with, uh, I mean, people are just ripping off, you know, a tweet goes viral and there's 50 tweets of the exact same thing or tweet you know, hunter is yeah. a tool that's powered by AI. That's literally designed. Yeah. That's their, like, that's their sales pitch. And it waters down the entire Twitter experience to where you're like, Oh my God, it's all regurgitated concepts of the same thing, which again, creates a thirst for unique, creative, authentic, right? It, it creates the, for something that's different. And that's where that's the real opportunity, because we all have the same tools, we all have 24 hours in a day. Um, so how do we how do we really kind of like create something that's uniquely us pro tip, just keep at it for long enough, and you'll figure out your style. Um, I, I've done a lot of snowboarding in my life. At one point, I lived across the street from a ski resort in the North Shore of Tahoe, had a shuttle stop in front of my house. I could ride back country back to my house. I've had many seasons where I've snowboarded 130 plus days per year. So in the game of snowboarding, you're, the first phase is falling a lot and it hurts. And most people don't go beyond that phase, right? Most people stop there. Same is true for Kindle book writing. Then there's this phase of competence where it's like, okay, I can actually get down the mountain right? I can actually publish a book. I'm competent at that, but you know, it's missing something. And then there's the third phase, which is what I call style. And style is when you've just been doing it for so long that you just kind of like relax, like it, you just get style. And I've got a lot of style when I snowboard. And that's just from my discipline of continuing to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Same is true with my YouTube videos. I have a style that is very me. It's not like I sat down and was like, okay, let me come up with Miles Beckler style. It's like, no, I did 758 videos in, in six years. And like it emerged through me finding that comfort, that sweet spot, which for me, YouTube is phone on a tripod sitting out on my property. I'm on 20 acres, sitting in the woods. And I just sit there, no camera lighting, no microphone, just literally my four-year-old Samsung phone. Kink, and I just share an idea. And I just feel so comfortable in that moment that it really, I bring something out that no one else in my niche has. Um, and the fact that you can see I'm just in the woods every time there's no noise, you can just tell I'm kind of on a big property. So it's, it's an interesting, unique positioning thing. And all that happened through me just I was a nomad when I started this all, right? Just just doing what I could as quickly and, and frequently as possible. Iteration, iteration, you know, fall down, get up, fall down, get up, fall down, get up as fast as I could. And then, then the style emerges from there. Now, that's a, that's a great insight. And, you know, something I think as people are going through this and trying to find their own style or their own niche and where they fit in is that like the practice and like just pushing through and like being consistent at it um, stands out as something that, if you're going to get at, get good at anything like it's like regardless of what industry you're in or what profession is like the ones at the top of the game have been doing it and practicing and going through that yeah like a long time and and who knows john benson it, yeah i mean it's, yeah been around for i mean pioneered dude the, the 60 VSL. yeah <laughs> dude 60 right like he's a boss and he's been doing this for a very long time like obviously he's really good at it and obviously he's really good at teaching it he's been doing this for absolutely ever 
Um, that, that is a factor. So one other thing I think is worthy of noting is the value in what's often referred to as niching down. Um, what I like to think of is solving more specific problems than anyone else. So if you, if you go to Amazon Kindle and you, you like go find a book that is about how to choose a niche for an online business. I don't think there's more than a couple of them if if there's more than mine, right? Like I have one that answers that one specific problem, that one specific question that people have. And so the the mere factor of me zeroing in so specific to that one little area of challenge within it, most people are like, okay, I'm going to be a marketing bro. I'm going to do internet marketing. Let me go make the, you know, the be all end all book to internet marketing. It's gonna be 800 pages and it's gonna be everything. And nobody's going to read the whole damn thing. No one ever. Right. And it's not going to sell. And you're going to waste months of time. And just, so if you're new, you can get in to focus on specific challenges. So someone in the weight loss space might, might come up with like, um, the shortcut to macros. I think macros is a thing. I don't know much about that. Right. Um, so it's kind of like thinking about the keto world as opposed to weight loss, as opposed to fitness, right? So it's, it's thinking of those nested layers to it. And when you go down into a little sub niche and I do my little niche thing, and I do my little sales funnel thing. And I do my, my little books in these specific areas, I can see which ones work better and then I can create, okay, cool. So that one worked better. So what would the next challenge they have be? So they solve that. What's next? Perfect. Ding, that's my next one. And I could build this little pathway that has a really high likelihood of working because each little step is it's that iteration cycle is, is brought down and each little step. Well, if that one worked really well, let me put the one after that. And then you go back into your first book and you update it to say, Oh, also buy this one. Then you go create a bundle. And every time people are looking at the one book, they can potentially bundle both of them and zooming way out. This is what we do in sales funnels. Right. So a, a properly uh, built sales funnel where I have maybe three or four courses in a row. So let's say I advertise on Facebook for somebody who's interested in selling more courses online. So I have like a sales letter template that I offer, but then a great upsell for a sales letter template would be a Facebook ads course, because once you have your sales letter dialed, you need traffic. So I can, I can create the next solution for them and I build pathways of paid products or it could be an auto responder follow-up. There's a lot of ways you can build a pathway, but ultimately I'm, I'm, my intention is to build pathways for people that they could guide themselves along at low ticket prices to get results because then all the high ticket bros are over here claiming, hyping, doing everything they have to do to make their $2,000 sale of how easy it's going to be. And I'm over here like, yo, it's going to take work, but like step by step by step will get you there. And when people realize that they're actually into motion, they start to see results with my content and they haven't been, I didn't bleed them dry of a couple thousand dollars, right? Before I even like on my first interaction, they know me, they like me, they trust me. And then if, and when I do run a small group mastermind for a thousand dollars for a four week mastermind, or I've done some uh, $3,000 to $5,000 in-person masterminds in Th Thailand and Bali, um, the, the willingness of people to say, absolutely, I'm flying across the world for that thing goes way up because of all the little experiences that they've had. And this is kind of a business philosophy. I, I would call it like the low ticket business philosophy, which, you know, 99 cent book on Kindle. Can we get lower ticket than that? Like, uh, Maybe like, I don't know. It's pretty tough though. Like we're, we're down pretty low, but what I'm doing is I'm making it so easy for people to gain an experience with my training to help them overcome something they've been stuck on. And if I do that, bingo, I go into this category of real deal people who actually get results. And that theoretically positions me from all the noise that they see on Facebook and YouTube. Um, because the ads there, like I'm, I'm against some absolute advertising assassins in that world. Well, I mean, that, that's a that's a great breakdown of it, Miles. And, and what it keeps like bringing to mind is like having that one on one way to interact and like continue to help people moving down that that funnel path, so to speak. If they solve one problem, what's the next one? What's the next one? What's the next logical way for them to get more from you? Because you've already helped them get a win and a result yep. on that first one. And you, you, you were talking about how you're showcasing your audio book that people can download as complimentary or get as part of the book on Amazon is a great way as like a resource to get them off of Amazon, but still playing the Amazon game. Uh, can you walk me through a little bit about maybe what you've seen work well for you in terms of like, maybe like just 
without all like the the hype or the fluff around like Amazon keyword and category research and just like yep. simplifying that part down, but also like simple ways that people that are putting their knowledge and expertise onto the Amazon platform and onto YouTube, like where are you sending them? Is it like a call to action at the end of every chapter? Are you getting people to just go to one simple opt-in to get more information? Because I'm assuming you're making these like additional offers to people that have already opted into your email list, uh, yep. potentially through YouTube, but. Yep. Um, relevance is important, right? Uh, so first disclaimer asterisk at the very beginning, I'm testing. Like I actually, uh, so that's one of the things that I have and, you know, through John Benson and through old school copywriters, like the one thing they all did is they just tested and tested and tested. So I continued to just blaze forward saying like, I don't really know what's going to work. So I'm just going to try a bunch of stuff and then I'm going to look back and see what happened and connect the dots through the data looking back versus attempting to, you know, like, okay, I'm going to come up with a perfect thing and then I'm going to launch the perfect thing. So that's kind of the, the preface for this. Um, one book, Sales Funnel Sabotage, literally goes to sell the recordings of my last mastermind where I brought in 50 people. It was like $1,000. So so the book is a sales letter. And the, the, the format of that book or the framework for that book is the 10 biggest mistakes people make with their sales funnels. Okay. Um, I know that there are a lot of people hyping up sales funnel software because there's some exorbitant affiliate commissions paid out by those software, which means there's this giant pool of people who are drinking the $297 a month sales funnel software Kool-Aid, thinking that the sales funnel is the solution. So my educated guess was that there's a big cohort of these people who aren't seeing the results that they want. They bought the big fancy thing and they're confused and they're distraught. And maybe through these 10 questions, you know, do you, did you get this right? Did you get that right? So it's literally like I came up with 10 questions with the help of chat GPT. We came up with 10 answers. This one was almost all written by chat GPT. Um, but then I sent it to my copywriter and had my copywriter go through it line by line from there to really take it because we, I have this sales funnel masterclass course. The recordings I often sell is like an upsell for like $97 is like the lowest price I sell them. I think if you follow the link in the book, it's a 197 offer from the book. If you go to my website cold, it's a 495 offer on my website. So the whole intention of this book is to attract someone who is having difficulties actually getting a sales funnel to be profitable. I'm going to run them through like a 10 step checklist and surprise, surprise, each one of those problems is actually covered inside of my course, right? So in that sense, I published a sales letter that is a book. It's kind of working. Um, and I run a bunch of KDP ads to it. So for that, I'm just, I'm putting it in the most relevant category I can. And I got my keywords all over the thing, right? My keywords are sales funnel. That's what I want it to be around. And it's sales funnel sabotage with a bomb on it. So it kind of stands out a little bit versus all of the other sales funnel thing. So if somebody goes to Amazon, right? I'm thinking user behavior, they're going to go there. They're going to vacation in Mexico. They're going to an all-inclusive resort so their kids can just play in the pool the whole time. And they're going to they're gonna figure out this sales funnel thing. So they're going to buy a couple of books for their Kindle while they're sitting by the pool in Mexico. They're going to get a sales funnel, my sales funnel sabotage book. They're going to see this as a short read. Yep, I'm going to go through that one. And in theory, if I help them, if they have a couple of aha moments, they're going to want the video course that's going to walk them through all 10 steps. Okay, that's just one completely unique example. And I'm running a lot of KDP ads, right? Kindle ads to that. Um, the other ones are much more to my opt-in list. So they're designed to take people from big picture idea. And then here's the freebie to get them on my list. And once they're on my list, I get to share all kinds of different things. Um, I generally would recommend people lean towards growing your email list from your book, because it's going to be a lot easier for somebody to say yes to a free opt-in than like a paid course, right? Like this is what I'm saying. I'm experimenting aggressively at different levels of things um, to see what works best. Uh, in my wife's brand, I like her big book has a call to action for a free audio in the beginning is got a call to action for a free book at the end. Those are separate opt-ins. And then it has a call to action to one inexpensive product, like an $11 guided meditation, like get the audio version of this thing. And then it has the other books by Melanie Beckler thing on that as well. Um, so generally speaking, 
your second book is one of the best ways for you to sell your first book, right? Like keep, keep if, if you sold them one, the odds are the lifetime value can go up if you keep making more books. So that that's step one. And then step two is what's the most logical, relevant way I can get people to get onto my email list, which is, is it a five-day challenge type thing? So if I had a fitness book that was how to count macros, I would just do a five-day challenge reveals. Simple landing page. I use lead pages. You can use any page builder in the world. Um, I mean, Aweber has a landing page builder that would be sufficient for this kind of thing. So does ConvertKit. Um, and then it would just be five-day challenge reveals the secret or, or let me walk you through. And if it's um, weight loss, it might be... Um, shopping lists. It could be a recipe book. It's like, so the book gives them the information. Let's say intermittent fasting is something, right? Like it's the shortcut. So um, you, the secret to intermittent fasting or intermittent fasting secrets is like the book. So anybody like, who's like, man, I'm in Mexico sitting by the pool. When I get home, I'm going to do something about all this, you know, extra that I'm carrying. So they'll, they'll theoretically pull out their Kindle device or their, their app. They'll go search intermittent fasting. They'll buy one or two or three books. If yours is inexpensive, got a bunch of star reviews and it's potentially a quick read, the odds are they're going to say yes to your book. And then that book helps them understand the big picture of how it works. And by the way, do you want my cheat sheet, my checklist, my five-day challenge, my uh, shopping list, my recipe book? That's the next logical step for them. And it's that, that kind of constant perpetual, what's the next logical step for them? And I do recommend most people build your email list from there. Um, there's a extremely high correlation between the revenue my wife and I bring in and the days we send out emails. Like we don't always make offers in emails, but my wife's list is like 160,000 subscribers. And we put together a, a $17 product last month and we had two $10,000 days because she mailed it twice and it was very time sensitive and, and it just crushed it. Um, and that, that happens because we just have this gigantic email list. Um, and it started with one and then it was two and then it was three. And um, I'm a huge email marketing geek. So all of this stuff and pretty much everything I do is designed to either grow my leads list or my customer list. And so final note on the tangent is somebody who buys my, let's say they buy my sales funnel sabotage book. And then they also purchase my sales funnel masterclass. They're on my customer list. That's the most valuable email list, right? Customer list and then leads list. And I'm always thinking, how do I get people from this list to that list? And how can I get more people on this list? And, and that's kind of like the old school direct response marketing game. Um, to market the books, we I always launch, I hustle up five-star reviews. So I have a list, right? So when I put out a new book, it's at 99 cents for the first week. And I did a free live on my YouTube channel. And it was like, hey, if you buy the book, leave me a review and reply with your receipt, you'll get access to a free live. I'll do a two hour Q and A call, pretty much a consulting session with me, which you can't even buy, right? It's, if you could buy it, it would be thousands of dollars, but you can't. So instead go buy my 99 cent book and show up live. And so I was able to get, I think 25 or 30 five-star reviews and about 70 sales. Um, boom. And I always try to launch a book with a bunch of five-star reviews. So when the hater shows up, because the hater's going to show up, and if you ain't got no haters, you aren't touching, you ain't reaching enough people. So, so go get you some haters. Um, and then when they show up, and I get that one star review from somebody who's frustrated because I did that thing they've thought about doing for years and they never did, I still have a 4.9 star rating versus letting the first couple of bad reviews hinder the book. Before we had email lists, I was like, Hey, auntie, would you go buy this book? Thanks. Hey, mom, go buy this book. Hey, dad, go. Hey, you know, like literally like we just hustled up our first 10 five-star reviews on that. Um, I like low price books. Amazon shows things that are low price. That, that's just, if you go search for a beach ball or a, you know, a snowboard, whatever, like anything on Amazon, their algorithm works on sales volume, star rating, and the price. And they're trying to find that balance of, what people really like, they really don't return very often. It gets pretty high reviews and it's also the best deal. That's what usually gets the best deal label. That's what I want. Um, so that's why all my books right now are 99 cents. I believe uh, it's my sales volume mixed with that low price is why I'm outranking people like Russell Brunson who charge $9 for his his book. Um, and then we run ads. I'm, I'm an advertiser. Um, there is no lack of traffic in this world ever. Uh, no one ever has a traffic problem. If anything, you have a conversion problem because when you solve your conversion problem, you can go buy traffic from absolutely everywhere. 
And this is getting into the world of what I like to call the celebrity authority. So I want people to look at my brand and think that I'm some sort of kind of like expert is another way, you know, Brendan Burchard might call it an expert. Celebrity authority is another phrase, but when they're on YouTube and they're searching sales funnel, there's Miles Beckler and his like YouTube video, right? When they're on Google and they're searching for sales funnels, they find my video or my blog post when they're on Amazon. I'm, so I want to be everywhere. And even if they're not searching for me, I run Google ads. So I show up on other websites. So they'll search sales funnel. They'll find unknown blogger too com and I'll buy that ad spot right there with the Google display network. And when they're on Facebook, even if they're not searching for sales funnel stuff, I pop up with my sales funnel stuff. So the fact that I'm just like everywhere presents my brand in a perspective that I'm like, I'm somehow bigger than I am. And that I'm somehow like, wow, this miles guy is ever he's on Kindle. He shows up everywhere. Like, obviously he knows what he's talking about. It's like, no, I just spent a lot of money in advertising. Right. Like, and so it, it's playing that game and my best return on ad spend it, right now is Kindle. The, the one challenge is um, the volume. So on, on Facebook, uh, YouTube ads, Facebook ads, Google ads, like you could, you could spend $150,000, $200,000 a day and you wouldn't run out of traffic. But when you get into these books, there's just not that many people you can show up to. So we, I usually spend, I would say, three to five grand a month in ads. And generally that makes money on the front end with the books. And then obviously all my calls, right? All that calls to action. So when I monitor my Kindle advertising numbers, all I want to do is break even. In a perfect world, I spend $1,000 and I earn back $1,000 and I'm net break even at the end of the month. But all those sales volumes are pushing me up in organic rankings. All those eyeballs see on my calls to action. Some percentage of them will get on my email list. Boom. I now have a um, self-liquidating system that doesn't cost me money out of pocket. There's that initial grand, but at that point, I'm just recycling the same thousand dollars through every month, growing my rankings and growing my email list at the same time. Yeah, and that, that's some of the the massive value with Amazon is that organic rank over time. That like the investment and like the consistency. Even if you can't spend a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand, whatever, you can spend five bucks a day. Yeah, that's yep. yeah, that's that's what I've heard, and it, it's just reinforcing what you know, we've had other Amazon marketers specifically. And I mean, that just seems to be the case. But yeah. if you're also pushing out a book, a short read every couple of weeks, like then you have that publishing velocity going on top of it. And if you have the team in place to help take maybe some of the things that you don't want to have on your plate, because you figured out the system. Um, and it seems like well, at your stage in the game, you've found a pretty solid workflow to focus on what you are best at focusing on and then yep. working with other humans in the process to operate, you know, and pull the different levers so that you, you know, have a lifestyle that makes you happy. Right. Yep. You know? And even on my AI written book, like that was my, he's like my operations guy who actually did the AI work. Like, like I'm not actually in AI saying like, okay, here's paragraph one here. No, I was like, dude, here's, here's what I got, make it into a book. And I got it back and I read it and I was like, ah, oh, this feels really AI like, and from there, it was like, do I send it, you know, who do I send it to, to take it to the next level? Uh, there's like proofreader, there's a copy editor, and then there's a copywriter. These are like broad categories of people who can help. And I went to the highest end of the copywriter and it cost me a couple of grand to get that thing done because it was super salesy specifically. And I wanted somebody who knows sales copy um, to write that. And, and it's that kind of philosophy of like, who, not how is one of the thoughts I like to think, like who can get this done for me? Cause like, I don't really want to do it, but I want the result of it. Um, I started by doing all the stuff though, too. Like I, I got to admit that as well. I don't know where, you know, everybody's in a different place when they get started. And, you know, my wife and I published our first books. Just, I did get layout InDesign help from a guy on Upwork. Um, I get my book cover still made on Fiverr, right? So I spend like 15 bucks for a book cover type thing. So there's always just these people that you can get to get the different things. And once you get your system done, it's something you can execute on over and over. And that's what I think people are searching for is their, their personal process. Um, and I'm clearly, obviously like I'm a talker, right? Like I just get going and it just, it's still talking. Right. So it's like, cool, leverage that. And some people aren't that some people, this moment of being on camera scares them. Um, perfect. Can you, are you a walker and a talker? Can you walk uh, is there like a nature trail where you could have your outline and paper and you could just hold your phone here and just go into like a voice memo. And then from a voice member memo, it goes to just run through the script yourself, right? Or send it to a teammate who runs it through the script. I mean, that's what my VA does for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
or are you the writer or are you the the prompt executor like it's like none of those are better or different or right or wrong it's just different pathways to the same place and when you find the pathway that's most in alignment with kind of your like dna your style your personal style you'll find that you'll get you'll ship more work right more things will get done and and the more you get more things done the more you're going to get that feedback loop of you know, number one can eh, kind of flop. Number two, oh, okay. Number two, so you know, okay. Number three, uh, not so bad. Okay, cool. So number four, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep making educated guesses based on the feedback loop I get from massive action. Yeah, the the action behind this is you know the the more you can publish and get stuff out there and get that feedback and the faster, um, you know, the better. And we were just having a our kickoff call today about like you know just. What's the minimum viable book look like that you can get out and start Ooh. to get that feedback on? Like That's that. kind of been our philosophy since the first book challenge. So like, if you, if you, yeah, you know, again, it's so easy to get caught in your head in like writing a book that's just got to be perfect and it's got to be all the things and it happens for months and months and it never gets published and it goes on end and then you finally get it out there and you put all this work into it and you're exhausted and, and then no one reads it because like, like, let's be real, like most people like aren't even going to like read the entire book, even if they buy it, like ideally yeah. they do. But I mean, if you can get them that result in 8,000 words, Amazon's not punishing you for getting a shorter book. What they want is you to like help their readers solve a problem that they're looking for. They and want happy customers. Yep. Yeah. And if you're, if you become the person that helps it, just like Google wants blog readers who have a high on-page time, a high click-through rate, right? Google has all these data points it looks at from the blog. YouTube wants a high watch-through rate. They want a high percentage of people to make it through 30 seconds. They want, you know, they want a high click-through rate. So, so every algorithm and our lives are run by algorithms. Every algorithm has its own kind of goals or KPIs, key performance indicators to measure how good your content is when it reaches their user. And if you're the best person within their selected KPIs, you're going to inch your way up and up and up and up and up. And there are ways for us to um, game those KPIs, I think. And um, it's kind of just being aware versus like publish and pray. Like, okay, here it is. And you know, that point of like, oh man, I poured everything into this. I call it the creative hangover. Um, John Benson probably sees this a lot. People create their course, it's their master class, it's their life's work. And then they have no more energy to do like the sales copy, the marketing, the advertising, which is the only thing that's going to sell it Right. And so there, there's a balance in there somewhere. Um, yeah, it's, I, I just think um, for someone who's starting out, for someone who has a practice, another way to look at books is if you have some sort of one-on-one -on -one coaching, if you have some sort of a high ticket thing, boy, books are some of the best front end offers. Like technically someone who buys your book is an Amazon customer, but they bought your book. So they're kind of your customer and the likelihood of someone who's bought your book and read your book about intermittent fasting to hire you for weight loss coaching. And that's where you make all your money. The likelihood of that person hiring you goes way, 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 way up. It's probably going to work better than a Facebook ads funnel. It's probably going to work better than a YouTube ads funnel because I've heard all that stuff there. That's an interruption mechanism versus you showing up when they're searching for something that they want. Um, and like, Amazon's crazy smart. So if I was looking for like um, keto supplements would be an example, right? So Amazon knows if I'm, if I'm shopping and buying, if I've been buying keto supplements for a long time, like keto book, keto, right? Amazon is going to put two and two together and Amazon mm -hmm. will for us test like, oh, here's things that other people who like that will buy, right? And so Amazon's going to do a lot of that work for me. And then it becomes like, okay, so my main product is weight loss coaching. So I've got a keto entrance point. I need a keto book. I've got an intermittent fasting entrance point. I've got an intermittent fasting point. And these are what some people call the top of funnel. These are just different entrance points. Um, you could replicate this whole thing out with different opt-ins for free books with email follow-up sequences and run them Facebook ads, right? It's the exact same game that a sales funnel person would use. We're just leading with the Kindle book as, as the very front end, which, okay, so I don't know if the keto entrance or the intermittent fasting entrance or the other one, I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm out of ideas. It's Ayurvedic or something, right? I don't know which one of those is going to bring me my best customers. So I better get to work 
and get them all built out and then see which one works best. And then at first I'll spit $5 a day advertising each of them. And eventually I might be able to run actual data through click tracking, through UTM parameters. There's ways to get the data to say, this book brings me the most customers at the best value. Perfect. All my advertising budget goes to that one now. Bingo, right? And all this can happen while all your competitors are just like, on the content marketing treadmill and they're just doing the Instagram reels every day and they're dancing and twerking on TikTok and you're just like very metho methodologically, methodically uh, building out these proven pathways from a platform, Amazon, where people are just, people are, they trust Amazon. They're, it's so easy for them to buy on Amazon. We've cleared a lot of the challenges that, that happen in, in making sales while still right. paving a pathway to um, the promised land. Yeah, it's it's very bottom of funnel when someone could still find you top of funnel through Amazon because because they're already there in the marketplace and they're looking for stuff to buy and Amazon wants them to buy more stuff and yeah. and it, the you know there, there's benefit to having your own website for your own products and offers too like on top of that but when you're talking about just getting it out there into distribution yeah. like what better advertisement than throwing your name and your brand and so easy to put five dollars a day on Amazon and just auto ads run. Like, you know, you can get you can get tricky with it if you really want to. But I mean, generally from books, what I've I've noticed is like it just just like what you're saying is it's not you, there's no need to overcomplicate it with this stuff. And it's not like you're running your own, it's not like you're managing like on it supplements or something and are fighting like that game with that type of inventory, especially when you're just doing a Kindle book. <laughs> And there's yeah. no inventory to buy. It, not overcomplicate things, guys. It's get the book out. Like the AI tools are there to help us along the way. Figure out what like gets you in the zone and gets you in the flow of getting the initial content out there. And then let's go ahead and click publish. And then, that's what the whole seven day book challenge is about. And you know, again, with the tools at our disposal and AI as our co-pilot along the way, like it now is more a time than any to start like really leveraging these tools to build our own personal brands to again, like solve real world problems and get other people results because the more people we get results, the more we're going to see, see like, you know, success in our own endeavors because we're helping other people along the way. Um, and I think you, you articulated perfectly miles. So I just want to say thank you for coming on and sharing with us. Um, yeah, man. Everyone here with us live right now, I'd love to kind of hear like you guys, you guys dig this. I mean, this is, I couldn't give you a much more, I, I couldn't give you a more clear cut way for how to just like approach this process with what we're doing. And if eight to 12,000 word is the the target for like a Kindle short read, you can go up to about 25,000 words if you want to get a spine on your book, which, you know, there's a place on the shelf for that. I mean, this is great. And absolutely doable inside of a seven day framework as long as you can commit to consistently showing up every day getting the content out there and doing the work to move it forward and then analyze the data and let the results will speak for themselves yeah and if i could like to take that process to the next level um learn this from jason fladley and um, one of his thousand dollar courses or something and like give yourself deadlines right leverage deadlines so phase one is brainstorm two hours I'm going to give you permission to spend two hours brainstorming what's the book, come up with a title, come up with a subhead. That means looking at what's working, cross-referencing what you know. So that's one, one two-hour session. You can't get your ass up out the chair for two hours. You sit there, your phone's gone. All you do is brainstorm for two hours. Then leave, whether it's the next day or later that afternoon, go for a walk, do something to shift your state, come back, and you got two hours to write an outline. That's it. That's all you have. How do you write an outline? Um, do you know the Udemy trip trick, Darby? You know, udemy.com, U-D-E-M-Y. It's a bunch of courses. So let's say I go to udemy.com and I look at intermittent fasting courses. I can see their best-selling courses and you can see the entire outline for that entire course right there. I am not giving you permission to steal someone else's outline, but I'm trying to help you understand how quickly you can go get an outline that you could make yours and improve upon if you need to. So step one, two-hour brainstorm session. Step two, you do a two-hour outline session. And then step three is a two-hour recording. Do it in a video, do it audio in your phone, do it sitting out back, do it wherever, go to a coffee shop, do it in your space where you feel free. And then once you have that, that final thing done where you just chatted for two hours, that's it. From there, 
transcribe it, AI out, AI edit. One last tip. Um, my wife, she's in the spirituality niche. There's a major publisher called Hay House Publishing. They do $100 million a year. They're based out of Southern California. Major publisher, like thousands and thousands of books. Um, biggest people in the marketing space. So she started telling chat GPT for like, here's my transcription. Edit this as if you were an editor for Hay House Publishing, for one of their best books on insert spiritual topic here. And the edits it came up with and the suggestions it came up with from there were like brilliant. It was really, really good. Uh, from there, proofreader. And like at that point, I'm on to Upwork or Odesk and I would get a proofread. I would get a title uh, cover made. When I get covers made on Fiverr, I usually pay three people to make three different ones because I want three ideas. It costs me like $45. I choose the one out of the three I like best and I go build that way cheaper than 99 designs and then um, have it proofread. There's proofreaders on up. It's, it's usually like a, was it? It's not even a penny a word. It's like 0.3 pennies a word or something like that. And just get a proofread just so you don't, there, 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 get something dumb, right? This is your sales messaging in a sense. So, so just spend the $130 it costs to get a proofread um, and then an InDesign person to, to run it out from there. And, and like, I was like, oh, I could explain this. It's super easy. And all of a sudden I realized I'm saying like five or six or seven steps, but really like you're building a business y'all. Like there's a lot to do. Let's just get to it. Let's get it done and um, outwork your competition, meaning publish more books and then out strategize them, right? Like li literally these ideas that Darby and I are talking about is not new per se, but these are just the inside things that, that self-publish people who dominate. And my wife and I have sold 135,000 books of our own. We would not take a publishing deal if they offered to be like, no, you, you want the money off of it. No, like we literally, it's not that difficult of a game to figure out. And it's, it's just the most brilliant front end. Um, then you could, you know, all kinds of stuff you can sell on the back end of this when you get a book funnel working. Fantastic, Miles. Well, thank you again for breaking that all down. Guys, cool. we will have this uh, replay inside of the community afterwards. I want to break down the transcript using AI and some of our recipes so you guys can have it and take action. And then full force day one coming up tomorrow. Let's rock and roll, guys. Take action. You can do Let's it. Going. Thanks, Miles. Cheers, y'all. Cheers.